Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another video at the Pharmacist Academy! Woo! Okay, so blood thinners or anti-thrombotics are a class of medications that you will learn a lot about in school and also manage patients on in your practice. Now in this video, I'll give you a general synopsis on the difference between the antiplatelet and anticoagulants class of drugs and when it will be appropriate to use one over the other. Thrombus, also known as a clot, according to Mayo Clinic, is a gel-like clumps of blood that form when certain parts of your blood thicken, leading to a semi-solid mass. Now, whenever we think about clots, we always assume the worst. So we are thinking about diseases, strokes, um, heart attacks, and all of that. But please keep in mind that clots are a part of your natural healing process, okay? So let's say you get a cut, clots are formed to prevent blood loss. But the problem is that sometimes if you have underlying conditions or due to certain things, clots may start forming randomly in our bodies, and our bloodstreams. So in this case, it forms and then there is failure to dissolve the clot after formation, which your body is usually pretty good at, right? So your body maintains that homeostasis with forming clots and also dissolving it after. And when this happens randomly, it may block the blood flow. So this is a general overview of how the clots normally look. As you can see, there is some red blood cells, fibrin, which is like a mesh-like protein that traps the platelets and keeps the platelets and everything else together. So normally, let's say you have an injury or damage to the blood vessels. Your body is going to activate the factors, the clotting factors that are responsible for regulating and also forming a clot. And of course, your platelets are going to be activated during this time and they're going to be recruited and they're going to go to the site of the injury, right? So while you're doing that, clotting factors are also going through a series of different mechanisms in order to activate this clotting factor known as thrombin. And thrombin will go ahead and activate fibrinogen, which will then create fibrinogen. Fibrin. And then the blood vessel also contracts in this case in order to push the blood away and kind of reduce the amount of blood loss. So then the platelet plug is then formed and then fibrin also does its final job of holding everything together and trapping more platelets. Now there are two types of clots that normally form in your body depending on if it's either the arteries or the vein. Now the arteries normally carry blood from the heart to the periphery. So that includes your brain, your other organs, your arms, your legs, etc. And arterial thrombus leads to strokes and heart attacks and peripheral artery diseases. And it makes sense, right? Because the blood is being pushed from the heart to everywhere else. So if there's a clot in the brain, it most likely came from the heart. And then you have the clots that form in the veins. Now the veins normally carry blood from the periphery back to the heart. So this is where we typically would We'll see the venous thromboembolisms, also known as deep vein thrombosis and or pulmonary embolisms. Another interesting fact about the arterial and venous thrombi is the components of that clot. So for the arterial thrombus, we normally see more platelets compared to fibrin. And for the venous thrombus, we normally see more fibrin compared to platelets. So with that, we are able to use medications that will target these clots based on your components. So for the arterial thrombus, we use antiplatelets, right? Because there's more platelets involved with this clot. And for the venous thrombus, we use anticoagulants because there's more fibrin involved with this clot. And the anticoagulants will target different clotting factors in order to reduce the production of fibrin. And here are some common medications. They may have slightly different mechanisms, but they are all achieving one goal, right? So for the antiplatelets, they want to reduce the platelet activation, platelet aggregation, or the recruitment of platelets to the injury site. So for the antiplatelets, they want to reduce platelet activation. Or for the anticoagulants, they want to reduce the amount of fibrin that's formed. Now, when would you use these agents? So let's say a patient has an acute coronary syndrome. So when you think of acute coronary syndromes, you could simply just think about a heart attack. So in these conditions, we love to use antiplatelets. I don't know if you guys have heard the mnemonic MONA, where the A is for aspirin, okay? So normally when that happens, you know, you would tell the patient to chew and swallow a non-enteric coated aspirin. 
So even after the initial management of this myocardial infarction, these patients must stay on aspirin indefinitely, usually 81 milligrams. And for certain patients, they may also qualify for dual antiplatelets with a different mechanism, right? So usually you have aspirin and let's say clopidogrel for about 12 months, but then you also have to take into consideration the patient's uh, bleeding risk. So sometimes in clinical practice, you may actually see them use antiplatelets anticoagulants such as heparin for patients with an acute coronary syndrome and this is usually when the patient is undergoing a procedure but when it comes to the general management of ACS antiplatelets are what you will see more often. Next, stroke prevention in patients with atrial fibrillation. So patients who have AFib are at a high risk of developing a stroke, but using anticoagulants can reduce their risk from like 5% to like 1%. So for AFib, because there is a risk of patient possibly developing a stroke, they use a scoring system to determine if the patient requires antithrombotics. So based on the patient's CHADVASC score, you would determine if the patient should be on anticoagulants to prevent them from developing a stroke. Now, previously, antiplatelets were an option also. So depending on the CHADVAS score, you may put the patient on an antiplatelet or an anticoagulant. Now, in 2018, the CHESS guidelines for anticoagulation and atrial fibrillation no longer recommended antiplatelet therapy. And the recommendation was more for anticoagulations. But there are other organizations that still recommend the use of antiplatelets for patients who can't tolerate anticoagulants. For peripheral artery disease, antiplatelets are one of the mainstays of treatments. And for the venous thromboembolisms, we normally use anticoagulants to prevent and also to manage these patients. But sometimes you may see aspirin and the aspirin recommendation is really for patients who are undergoing some kind of orthopedic surgery. So whether it's a knee surgery or hip replacement, those are the patients who they recommend to use aspirin. But normally you see patients on like DOAX or like heparin or Lovenox in order to manage this condition. Then we have the medically ill patients. So many times when a patient get admitted to the hospital, depending on their risk factors, they may put the patient on DVT prophylaxis. And in this case, we usually use anticoagulants. So specifically sub-Q heparin. And sometimes they may even put the patient on low molecular weight heparin, such as Lovenox, in order to prevent the formation of a DVT. And that will be all, folks. This was a short video, but I think I hit the major points. If you learned anything at all from this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and also share the video and help the channel grow. Connect with me on the social media platforms. Thank you for watching this video and take care.